In North America, for anybody, what is probably the most famous university um, for anybody in the world? You go to anybody in the world, what do you think the most... Harvard, Harvard, okay? So the Chan School of Public Health, the home of scientific bullshit, okay? One of my countrymen, Walter Willett, has, the, has published and published and published all these articles that have very, very little scientific basis. At least that's my bias, that's my opinion. But guess what? It may be true. What we've seen, and we see this repetitively from physicians and doctors and everybody, is study after study after study. And the one thing I know absolutely after 30 years of doing this type of work is that none of those studies really mean a lot. So I'm going to take you down uh, a series of logical steps and I'm going to challenge a lot of the things that are entrenched. I'll probably piss a lot of people off. My intent is not to piss you off. My intent is to make you think. Okay? Because I can tell you one thing. That's not a good way to die. And the majority of us are going to die of a heart attack, of a stroke, or of some form of cancer. All of them directly related to what we put in our face whether that's alcohol, nicotine, or carbohydrates, because we've cured infectious diseases. We're incurring, in fact, in the next couple of years, when we can drive uh, automated cars, we're going to cure killing people while we're texting. So really what ultimately is killing human beings right now is what we do to ourselves. And as I said earlier on, the, to my mind, um, the ketogenic diet is how human beings are designed to live. And instead of trying to find better and more effective products and things to make magically, uh, to make us live, le live longer, let's figure out what's shortening that lifespan. The diseases and the things that we do to ourselves shorten that time span. So instead of trying to say the ketogenic diet lengthens life, no, that's how long we're supposed to live. Let's get rid of the things that shorten us. And type 1 diabetes is one of the commonest killers um, of people with this unfortunate disease, they're dying of, oops, sorry, they're dying of all those diseases. So let's, let's look at this from my perspective. One of the gods of changing our thought is Dr. Bernstein, and he wrote a sentinel paper together with a number of, of ketogenic colleagues looking at the health improvements um, on a ketogenic diet, and he used that as a foundation for diabetes. So Bernstein is the Bible for most type 1 and type 2 diabetics. What we're going to do today is go beyond Bernstein. Beyond Bernstein. We're going to take some of what he's done and go beyond that. Just like Eric Westman has gone beyond Adkins. The key, the key, the key, the key is that hormone. Insulin. And we've got to change. Just like I said, it's not about living longer on a ketogenic diet. It's about living longer, shorter on a non-ketogenic diet. We have to change our understanding of what insulin does. Insulin was discovered in 1921 in Toronto where I did my PhD. I worked with a lot of the guys that, that are the after-children of Banting and, and uh, Dr. Banting and uh, Best who did the initial discovery of insulin. But they had discovered insulin in the evolution of the carbohydrate era. So guess what they said? They said that insulin's primary job is to remove sugar from the bloodstream. That can't be true. That cannot be true if you believe it's true that human beings are designed to be in ketosis. If human beings are biologically designed to be in ketosis, then insulin's job is not to remove sugar from the bloodstream, and it isn't. So we've got to change our way of thinking. That's not insulin's primary job, that's a backup job. The primary job for insulin is to regulate a hormone called glucagon. And glucagon's job is to produce sugar in the liver primarily, and other organs, but primarily the liver, and take other substrates, amino acids and fatty acids, and turn them into sugar and deliver them into the bloodstream to maintain our blood sugar. The source of sugar in human beings should not be our face. It should be our liver. Change your perspective. Okay, So therefore, if the source of sugar is our, is our um, liver, then what we have to do is to reduce the hepatic production of sugar, the liver production of sugar. And that is done through glucagon. So insulin's primary role is to regulate glucagon, number one. Number two is if you're dampening down the amount of sugar in your bloodstream, maintaining it in a very tight glucose clamp, and that's critical. The human body is very effective at maintaining glucose in a very tight clamp. What I mean by a clamp is in a very tight, narrow range of, of blood sugar. 
Then the other job of insulin is say, okay, we don't have enough sugar to live on. Where do we get energy from? We get energy from our fat cells. But if you've got too much energy coming from the fat cells, what they're called ketones, if you've got too much energy coming from your fat cells, that's not a good thing either because you can get acidotic over time when there's high sugar and high fat. So insulin's job is to switch glucagon off, and also when insulin levels rise, when insulin levels rise it switches off a, an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase that is responsible for the release of ketones of fat from the fat cells. So low insulin, insulin levels, you're in ketosis and you're burning fat as a fuel source. Okay? High insulin levels, you switch that off because the premise is that your pancreas is producing that insulin because your blood sugar is rising. And if you notice, my arms are doing this all the time because that's how the body works. Another critically important thing, things don't happen in the human body. Every action has a reaction. It's called homeostasis. And homeostasis is probably one of the most important words when you're thinking about human function, human biology. Nothing happens in isolation. Um, the point is our sources of sugar, uh, that's where we get it from the, in the diet. Okay? Some of us say, oh, that's healthy. Well, it's still a source of sugar. And in the modern, uh, in the modern way of thinking, insulin, I the role of insulin, oopsie, sorry, the role of insulin is to remove sugar from... Uh, our diet from, from what we put in our face. But really, the real role of, of insulin, as we said, is to modify glucagon, which produces sugar. Okay? So when you do not have, when you've lost the capacity to produce insulin, and you, your pancreas just can't produce any insulin, that's type 1 diabetes. When you can produce a large amount of insulin or a moderate amount of insulin, but you're consuming so much carbohydrate, the tissues have become resistant to it, that's insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes. There are a few minor diseases that affect, the, uh, that affect glucagon and a cortisol effect might come in. So here's what happens. And the problem with type 1 diabetes is we've got a lot of theories. We really don't know why. Um, but ultimately what happens is you get death um, of the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. So you're not able to produce insulin under any stimulation. And the issue there is that you lose glucagon's control. So even in someone on a completely ketogenic diet, where they're not putting a single carbohydrate in their face, they still need to supplement insulin to block the effect of glucagon and to, to dampen the production of fat from the fat cells. Remember, it's all ebb and flow. It's all homeostasis. So the only difference between normal and type 1 diabetes should should be the fact that the type 1 diabetic has to provide exogenous insulin. In other words, has to inject insulin. There is no reason why a type 1 diabetic cannot be completely normal. And that is the treatment goal. At least that's my treatment goal with my diabetics. The ADA, we want to get your A1C below 7. Well, that's just slowing down the progression of disease. Okay, so as I said before, the role of insulin is to control fat metabolism and to control glucagon. It is not primarily there to remove sugar from the blood. And harm only happens in a type 1 diabetic when the blood glucose remains elevated, when you get spikes. The other critical thing about understanding type 1 diabetes is, okay, so these diabetics are giving themselves insulin. And the standard uh, uh, endocrine, endocrinologist way of treating them, or the certified diabetic educators, those experts about diabetes, who know everything about diabetes, what they do is they use insulin to treat your consumption of sugar. But remember what I said, if you're eating all these frequent small little meals and you're pouring sugar into your face all the time, even in a normal person, you become insulin resistant. So whether you're giving insulin to yourself or whether it's coming from your pancreas, Everybody gets insulin resistant over time, even type 1s. So the majority of type 1s that we see have a type 1 component and a type 2 component. And most people don't take that into, into the thought process. So when you're treating type 1s, you also um, want to be able to understand that they have insulin resistance, resistance to the medication. And when they come off carbohydrates, that makes them much, much more sensitive to insulin. You need to be aware of that. Okay, so that's my preamble. Well... Here's the current standard of diabetic care from the American Diabetes Association and the uh, Juvenile Diabetes Research Fund. Very heavily supported by industry. So already you've got a dichotomy. If 
these people here, the people that produce these medications, are your primary supporters and your primary funders. How the hell are you going to tell people that you can manage your diabetes by not taking those medications? You're screwed. Okay? If this funds me, am I going to say, no, 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 you're wrong, this is bad? But look, look at that list, look at that list of, um, look at that list of medications. I, don't, I can't even pronounce those names, let alone know what the hell to use them for. And I do this for a living. So the other, the concern, the first concern is that as physicians, we typically treat a disease or call it a disease when it reaches treatment level. That's a mistake. We should be treating to normal. First change in thinking. The second thing, this comes from, this, from the ADA website. Healthy eating, contrary to popular perception, there's no specific diabetes diet. However, it's important to center your diet on these high-fiber, low-fat foods. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, fewer animal products, refined carbohydrates and sweets. Low glycemic index foods and regular aerobic exercise may be helpful. I love that because you know what? It keeps my office busy. Okay, and this again is the list of medications. Then we also do blood sugar monitoring and we do AccuChecks, we do continuous glucose monitoring, um, and understanding when to test and what the goals of treatment are important. And really the focus of these guys is treating, not preventing, but treating the consequences of that chronic excessive blood sugar, and there's the list. Okay, how do we change this around? Well, the other thing, if you're a diabetic yourself, especially a type 1, these are the two things that we fear, and it's important to get clarity about these. Most, most of us know this. Um, when you have too little insulin, your glucagon is unrestricted, so your blood sugar goes up. And you can't, there's no feedback dampening. Okay? But at the same time, you don't have any insulin, so what are your fat cells doing? They're pouring fat and ketones into your bloodstream. You should either be living on sugar or living on fat. But when both happen, and your body can't use the sugar, but it can use the, use the fat, that excess fat produces lactate in the bloodstream, and that is something called ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis is very different than ketosis. Ketosis means your blood sugar is low and you're using fat. Ketoacidosis means your blood sugar is high, but you can't use the sugar, and therefore the only way you can live is to use fat. And that damages the body. Ketosis does not do that, and you'll hear a lot of the naysayers use the confusion about these two similar words as a weapon to malign us with. So it's critically important that we understand this. But the fear of a Type 1 diabetic is too little insulin, and then they become DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, and the pathway is right there. Or they have too much insulin, which is actually more scary. And we heard Eric Westman talk about that a little while ago, where they become hypoglycemic. Both are concerns. Most diabetics have a, a, a sort of a concern about the diseases, but this is their daily concern. And how do you balance that if your blood sugars are doing this all day long? Almost impossible. So every day, they're going between those two. Okay, so the conventional management of type 1 diabetes, manage blood sugar with medications, not diet. And when your blood sugar is too low, eat more carbohydrates. When your blood sugar is too, too high, add more medication. Okay? They treat insulin resistance with more and more medications, and... The intention, the, the, the intended goal is to slow down the progression of what they call inevitable disease. Diabetes should not be an inevitable disease. Remember, 65% of our diabetics are going to die of a heart attack. Okay? So what do they do? They use these diets, they use all these medications, and the goal is to reduce the diabetic from dying in pieces. Losing a leg, losing a kidney, losing a brain, losing an eye heart attack, stroke, that's what faces these folks, and that is unnecessary. So, when we're treating diabetics, and I know this sounds stupid, but we've got to confirm that they're type 1s. The number of patients I get in my office that are told they have type 1 diabetes and they're actually type 2s, and type 2s that have been mis type 1s that have been misdiagnosed with type 2s all the time because nobody checks the insulin level. They've got a super low insulin level, they're type 1s. Okay, but you want to confirm that. So that's the first thing. Confirm the diagnosis. Then the next thing is, and, and everyone says, oh, how much carbohydrate? 50 grams, 60 grams. Some people are different. Bullshit. 
The treatment goal for type 1 diabetics is zero carbohydrate consumption. How much alcohol should an alcoholic consume? Do we just use heroin on Wednesdays? No. Okay, so the treatment goal is zero. Zero, zero, zero. And in your mind should be, I need to get in zero carbohydrates. What di the dietary people love to do is build in an allowance. So if you're sober the whole day, you can have a little bit of beer at night. Crazy. Okay, the goal is zero. Yes, there are incidental carbohydrates in some of the foods that we eat. And you establish a limit to the incidentals, but it's not an eat up to a number. We use 30 grams per day in our office, but the goal is to be zero. And if I put a bit of milk in my coffee, there might be two grams of carbohydrates in that milk that counts toward my 30. It's therefore incidentals, but it's not an allowance to eat up to. Does that make sense? And we don't count vegetables. Because otherwise, I'm sitting on my darn calculator the whole time and destroying my day. The I don't care whether you are an over-lacto-vegetarian uh, over or a pisca-vegetarian, I like the, what is it, uh, um, aqua-vegetarian, all the way through a nose-to-tail carnivore. I don't care. But anything to the left of a vegetarian that occasionally eats either renewable animal products or dead animals, either way, um, I believe is a form of malnutrition. Because if you have to supplement your diet from GNC to be healthy, to get everything in that you need, that is a diet of malabsorption. And I'll take on any vegetarian and any vegan. And I understand the religious components, and that's fine. But at least get some animal products in because humans were designed to be that way. Okay. So the goal is zero carbohydrates, and the goal really, why are we doing that? Because we want to change the source of blood sugar from the mouth to the liver. We want the liver to produce the sugar, not the mouth to consume it. And that puts insulin in its traditional role of modifying glucagon, not dealing with sugar. Okay? Now, as I've said before, beware of lean protein. What does the human body do when you eat lean protein? It turns it to sugar. Gluconeogenesis. Wonderful process, okay? So, what does glucagon do? It uses a little bit of protein and also fat, and the glycerol that's attached to fat to maintain our blood sugar. Remember, you only need five grams. So it's a very small amount to maintain blood sugar. But lean protein knocks us out of ketosis, and this whole focus on protein, protein, protein harms the whole ketogenic movement. The principle is to use fat. This, or what we're eating, is our primary fuel source to maintain ketosis, no exogenous carbohydrates, except for incidentals, and get our blood sugar from the Krebs cycle and gluconeogenesis modulated by glucagon. We want to protect lean protein by fat consumption and fat fortification. What is fat fortification? Even if you try to eat uh, the modern American way, they've cut fat out of everything. So when you eat a steak, it's not what came out of the animal, it's the steak minus the fat. So fat fortification is using butter, mayo, olive oil, coconut oil, avocados, eggs, cheese, bacon, to increase the fat content of food and protect the lean muscles that we're eating. Um, again, protein is not a macronutrient, it's a micronutrient, and the goal of this treatment is no comorbid disease, even though you have to use insulin. So the next step, remember we talked about wooden coal? Well, when you're on a ketogenic diet, that fat burns very slowly, it's like burning coal. So automatically, unless you force yourself to eat, automatically you don't feel like eating. It is impossible or nearly impossible to sustain intermittent fasting on a carbohydrate diet. Why? Because your blood sugar is going up and down all the time, and every time it goes down, you get hungry and you eat. That's why they tell us to eat six or eight small meals a day. It's almost impossible to do that on an effective ketogenic diet. When you're in deep ketosis, you are not hungry. So it's automatic. Allow your body to do what it does. And one of the treatment goals for a type 1 diabetic is to get them into ketosis, not ketoacidosis, and they start eating one or two meals a day. Almost everybody, eh, everybody wakes up in ketosis. So breakfast is the least important meal of the day. The concept of breakfast in the 1800s came from the Kellogg's brothers. Most important meal of the day, kickstart your metabolism. That's, those are advertising slogans to sell, to sell Kellogg's. God and nature didn't decide that. Okay? Why else is that important? Because in the morning when you're in ketosis, your insulin level is at the lowest, glucagon's working the most, what happens? Your blood sugar's high. It's called the dawn effect. It is normal. 
Don't treat the dawn effect. Too many endocrinologists, oh, your blood sugar is high in the morning. You're Don't measure your blood sugar before you've been up for two hours and you're fine. Nothing bad happens. It's simple logic. It's not science, it's logic. Because science, go to Harvard. Um, so what happens if I need a snack? Well, a snack is always an emotional event. The human body does not require snacks. So a snack is something we do, like a cigarette, to manage the tension and the stress and the brain focus every day. We'll discuss that in detail tomorrow. However, as a fat guy, I know I need to put something in my face on a regular basis. And I coined the term a bridge. A bridge is a snack, something I consume for my head that doesn't contain calories. And when you're trying to lose weight or trying to treat diabetes, type 1 diabetes, the bridge should not contain calories. However, if you're a skinny little Hollywood girl whose living is your body, sorry, I don't mean to be sexist, Hollywood person, um, then you may need to fat fortify that bridge with MCT oil or cream to keep the leptin going so that you can only eat a small amount of food and maintain your weight. But a guy like me, if I do that, I'm not losing any weight and I still want to drop some. And the same thing is true with diabetics. So you want to get them not to snacking, which is what the CDEs tell you all the time. Snack, 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 and control with insulin. No way. Stay away from that and allow leptin to do its job. The goal is, during that time where you're not eating, well, you still need energy. The goal is to get your liver, that always preferentially stores a little bit of energy as glycogen, to empty itself out. And then you establish a relationship between your liver and your fat cells, and you're deep in ketosis. So as long as there's energy in the liver, primarily in the source of glyco store, uh, in, in glycogen, the liver is going to put that sugar into the bloodstream and you're going to have trouble maintaining your blood sugar. But once your liver is empty, once it's relatively depleted of glycogen, your liver has to go somewhere else. And if your insulin level is low, it goes to your fat cells. If your insulin level is high, it either goes to your mouth, so you feel hungry, or it goes to your muscles. And you don't want either of those two scenarios. So, the concept of, intermit of intentional intermittent fasting is another concept of bullshit. It's almost impossible to sustain intermittent fasting if you're, on, if you're burning sugar, if you're on a high sugar diet, because your blood sugar is going up and down. Intermittent fasting happens naturally when you're in ketosis. The concept has to be allowed by the human brain. In other words, we have to overcome the fact that we have to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner and have two snacks. That's never been the process by which we eat. My dog eats once, maybe twice a day. And even if I put the food out, that's what he does, because my dog's in ketosis, just like me. So the point is allow vicarious intermittent fasting. Now, one thing about diabetics, they should never go longer than 23-1. And I would argue, and I know I'm going to get a lot of pushback on this, nobody should ever go longer than a 23-1. These five-day fasts, these three-day fasts, I, and Steve Finney, I want to throw that name out there, has an issue with that. Because starvation is not a normal human response. It's a tolerable one. It may cause some good effects every now and then to drop some weight. But definitely diabetics should not do that. Why? Because they go into ketoacidosis. So you want to watch that very closely. The best thing for diabetics is a 16-8 or an 18-6, possibly a 23-1. The next concept, remember we talked about emptying the liver. Well, after a meal, even a ketogenic meal, the liver is going to retain glycogen, build glycogen and retain that for around three to four, maybe six hours after a meal. You want to try to shorten that period of time to get back into that deeper ketosis. And one of the ways you can do that is frequent physical activity. What's that physical activity? It's parking your car a little further away. It's taking a set of stairs. It's carrying a basket at the store rather than pushing the cart. Um, there are opportunities to be physically active all the time. My liver doesn't know if I'm going to walk an extra 10 seconds across the parking lot or go for a two-mile run. So it preemptively releases sugar into the bloodstream and empties my liver. The other role of physical activity, as we'll talk about tomorrow, is the endorphin effect. So if you control, instead of trolling for snacks, you troll for opportunities to be physically active, you manage your liver more effectively. And the goal there, remember I said type 1s also have a type 2 disease, is for insulin sensitivity. Continuous glucose monitoring, very important for, for type 1 diabetics because it gives them instant feedback. And the goal of the, uh, I think this is my second final slide, the goal of 
um, the CMOD management, carbohydrate insulin management of obesity and diabetes, as opposed to the lipid heart management or the calories in, calories out, is to use small doses of short-acting insulin to modify and to switch off glucagon and to manage the amount of ketones coming from your fat cells. That's the role of these little bits. So an insulin pump may not be a good idea for someone on a keto, for a type 1 diabetic on a ketogenic diet. Yes, they have to stick needles into themselves a little bit more often. But if that's keeping them disease-free and preventing highs and lows, they typically love that. I may, from time to time, add a little bit of a longer acting, especially Levomir, that has a slightly higher peak and then a flow, as opposed to Lantus, um, early on and use that to manage the high dawn effect, although eventually they can come off that. And we may even add metformin, which is a medication in type 1s that have a high type 2 effect, a high uh, insulin resistance effect, to sensitize their tissues to the uptake of sugar. I use that transitionally when I'm transitioning my patients across. But the goal is to suppress glucagon and, and gluconeogenesis and increase the peripheral uptake of sugar. And that's why short-acting intermittent small amounts with long basal off periods. Because that's the way my body works. My body does this at a mealtime and then it's flatlined in terms of insulin. Why not reproduce that for the, for the, um, for the type 2 diabetic? Um, there are some other crazy things, the coolings, the longer fasting, the exercise. Those are questionable in terms of the science, but a lot of type 1s believe intensely in this, and that's fine. The most important thing is just do no harm. Cooling certainly helps to lower your blood sugar, but the best thing is don't go, have, require the craziness of the day because your blood sugar is out of control. And doing this and eating the way we talked about, becoming fat adapted and being in, in ketosis, keeps your blood sugar very, very level, and more important, keeps your insulin requirement very, very level. And the goal is to radically reduce insulin requirement, get A1C to 4.8 to 5.2, and keep your blood sugar at 80 or lower. Most diabetics are incapable of doing that, our group of diabetics routinely able to do that. In France and in Hong Kong, I've got groups of diabetics who are type 1s who are running triathlons at a very competitive level. And they're running on ketosis with almost no insulin requirement. Okay? Very, very impressive with normal numbers. So we want to avoid the lows and the spikes and avoid the greatest fear, which is dying in pieces.